I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Hey guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. <laughs> and we're very lucky today to have with us Mark Smith, zoologist and curator of Adelaide Zoo. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to say, you have a very mellifluous, excellent broadcast voice. I've said that 90 odd times now, haven't I? That intro. Yeah, you, you're good at that. Yeah, and how he says, Steve. <laughs> it's a bit longer each time. <laughs> As um, the reputation grows, so indeed does the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Mark, you're currently the curator of the Adelaide Zoo, but there's, you've done so much more than that, haven't you, mate? I have. I came to the Adelaide Zoo obviously very recently, and I have had the real fortune of working at multiple institutions around the world. I've actually worked on projects on every continent except Antarctica, actually. (laughs) Not many zoos there, though, is there? No, not You don't like Antarctica? No, I think it's it's fabulous. I have not not had the opportunity to go there. I mean, I've gone to some sub-Antarctic climates, and I've actually been to above the Arctic Circle as well, but I've never been to Antarctica, unfortunately. One day, maybe. Uh, But yes, I just, I grew up in the bush in Australia and although I could have probably been a farmer, I fell in love with native flora and fauna and then ultimately exotic flora and fauna and I just wanted to do that. So even though I I guess someone of my background would have probably gone back on the land and that would have been the expectation of my family, my parents, they, they said to me when I was about 12, what do you want to be when you grow up, son? And I said, I want to be a marine biologist. <laughs> and that, they, that was his mum. <laughs> <laughs> she was a very <laughs> forthright country woman, deep Farmer. voice. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they, and they, to their credit, from what was a pretty uh, conservative background, they were very supportive, a little bit puzzled initially, but very supportive. And after a couple of years of saying the same thing, they said, well, we need to support our son in pursuing this career. So I did an, under, I did an undergraduate degree in biology. I uh, did a postgraduate degree in biology and uh, got my first job at SeaWorld on the Sunshine Coast. Not because I had any qualifications, because I could scuba dive. And I learned to dive very young. I was actually 16 at the time, which probably wasn't strictly legal, but they bent the rules a little bit because I was a tall, strapping young man. And I, I, just, I, just, I just could not get enough of going in the water and working with animals and playing with animals. And I tell people this and they can't even believe it, but really, really early on, I, I just love moray eels. And moray eels, they will actually come out of their hole and they'll go into your, your vest and just sit with their head up and you can hand feed them. They don't have very good eyesight. They rely very heavily on smell and they get cataracts. So they tend to uh, lunge at things. So if you put food in the right location, they'll lunge at the food, but they can miss and might bite you by mistake. Uh, But another thing you can do, which sounds kind of ludicrous, but underwater, you can put your face mask right up against the moray and it it sees enough to see itself and you can slowly back away and it'll draw it out of its hole. And then you can use your hands like like a... uh, substitute cave and they'll come all the way out of their hole and you can sort of just have them I've wow. seen sort of in your vest like funneling them <laughs> yeah exactly and then, and, then, and then they'll so to me that that is kind of second nature and I'm not traumatised by that prospect whereas I wouldn't do that with a snake because I just don't have that familiarity whereas you guys are much more accustomed doing, to doing that with an animal yeah, uh, well a I, serpent of, I always uh, get people who come here and, and will go through handling a lot of snakes and that and, and most of the time Harry said it before uh, a guy that helps us out a lot um, you know I've never seen you get bitten by, your, yeah. by any of your snakes like how do you do that like it, it is just working out that and, and that's, yeah. that's part of the reason why you stick to that that's part of the reason why you kept diving is because you worked that out with, a, with the eel uh, with the eel and, and you kept on doing that because that would have just kept with you that you yeah. worked that animal out that's awesome I want to do that to her and I had, the, 
I had the fortune also of you know, diving you know, in the tropics and with sea crates. And uh, so this is a very broad sweeping statement, but sea snakes in general, they're not aggressive no. and they, you know, you can swim in, in and around them with not complete impunity, but you're very safe. If you were to grab one of those animals or stand on it, then you're obviously at, at, at more risk. But they are very, uh, very relaxed animals, I would say. So I, yeah, so I was very early on doing a lot of diving um, with all sorts of animals. And then I got the job at SeaWorld because I could dive. And I really, in, over that Christmas holidays, I really fell in love with working with animals. So I worked at SeaWorld at the end for about seven years. And there was no education program at SeaWorld and no research at all. I was the first undergraduate to be, or I should say, I was the first postgraduate to be employed at SeaWorld and probably a bit starry-eyed. And I said to my boss, you know, we could, we could do education programs here. We could do research. And he's going, that sounds like a good idea, Mark. Yeah, we could do that. And I didn't realise, I think he was sincere, but he had no idea how that would happen. Mm. And so... I had become quite friendly with a secondary school teacher in Southport, which is across the water from SeaWorld. And I said, if I wrote uh, an education module, would you bring your students in to SeaWorld? He said, that sounds great. So I have no background in education, but I thought, well, I'll just write this, you know, ichthyology module. And we had this fantastic blackboard, whiteboard, which was the ocean tank full of live animals. Hmm. And you could talk about some sort of anatomical feature and just point to it. And so I did that uh, module, invited him in, and SeaWorld got deluged with letters from students saying, this was just fantastic and wonderful, and it was like the birth of the education program. And now it's a massive, a massive wow. uh, program. So everywhere I went from that point forward, I made sure we had education as a key part of the, the program or the, the project. And then the same thing with research. Just quickly on education, when I got to Barcelona, which was the first place I went to work after SeaWorld, it was to set up a new aquarium in Barcelona, which is a gorgeous city in Spain. And our first year, we had 1.98 million visitors. By comparison, Adelaide Zoo gets about 650 which is really, really good and healthy for a city of the size of Adelaide. But we got almost like very close to 2 million visitors in the first year at Barcelona. 22% of them were school students as part of the education program. And I was very fortunate to recruit this fabulous educator, Jordi Indiano, his name is. Um, still a good friend. He's now, I think, the director of conservation at the Barcelona Zoo. He led the sort of spearhead of the development of the education programs at Barcelona and set up three laboratory classrooms. We had enough space to do that and they're filled almost every day. It's just, it's absolutely wild. Uh, very, very cool. So I, so it's going back to when I was at SeaWorld, uh, we just had so many resources there that we could take advantage of that it was the, an opportunity to start, edu uh, to start a research foundation and there's a very long backstory there, but in short, because humpback whales and dugong and turtles were getting caught in the shark nets off the coast of uh, Surf's Paradise, there was a real interest in minimising the entrapment of non-target species. And that happened to parallel with John West at the time being very concerned about having dolphin-safe tuna nets and so they came to SeaWorld and said, we would like to donate some money towards research. And we said, this is, a, this is like a great opportunity to set up a research foundation. And it was the genesis of SWARFI, which was the SeaWorld Research and Rescue Foundation. And I was the first uh, scientific liaison, and my job was to bring together a group of independent researchers from universities around Australia to convene this research group that was in I believe I'm right in saying it was in 1991 I think and they've been doing research since which is fantastic I mean like a lot of a lot of good um, independent research it's not just about you know 
um, working with dolphins because there's a skill set there at SeaWorld where they work with dolphins. It's actually um, all sorts of different strands of marine research that, that the foundation uh, supports, which is great. So again, when I went to Barcelona, I did the same thing. We started Research Foundation. and uh, So this is all becoming a very long story. I'll, it's a great story, don't I'll, worry. I'll, I'll summarise the, the next part. Um, so I was at SeaWorld for seven years. I, I hadn't done everything I wanted to do there, but I felt like I'd done a lot and, uh, and was ready f- to really expand, I guess, my horizons, my educational horizons. In other words... I wanted to learn more. I learned a lot at SeaWorld, but I think my capacity to learn more was starting to level out and I wanted to go to it elsewhere and, and try other things. And I saw a video of the Osaka Aquarium, which was just a spectacular project and very aspirational for me. I thought, oh, that, that's just, that looks wonderful. What a great institution. I actually did not end up going to Japan though. So I was offered a job in Singapore, which I ultimately didn't take, but the same company uh, a few well, a few months later offered me the job in Barcelona. I was nine days away from getting married at that time, and my wife and I had a plan to go to Western Australia. I was going to go to the aquarium there as the curator. I'd been offered a position there. And... She was offered a position at the ABC in Perth. She's a journalist. And I, she, I was offered a position in Barcelona, and so nine days before we were getting married, I called my wife and said, you know how we were thinking about going to Perth? How does Barcelona, Spain sound? And she was really... Uh, very supportive and excited. I thought you were going to say something else then. <laughs> I think she was even more excited than I was. I was a little bit... Uh, anxious about well, uh, maybe I can't do the job, you know, and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and my job was to go over and basically recruit, train, and manage the team that would start the aquarium up and get it running. So I did that from mud, like from just ground zero to completion, 18 months, built the aquarium, and then stayed for a year and a half afterwards just to make sure all the systems were running well and so on. And this was very pretty early in my career. I was more inclined to just say, job's done. Time to move on to the next thing because I didn't want to sort of hang around and, you know, prevent the other members of the team from growing. And I really got excited about people just flourishing and, and someone who may not have had an opportunity to do something like this, suddenly they just can become someone caring for animals and just bloom. And, uh, you know, I've got lots of people I look back on and just see how, how much they blossomed in the time that they were working at the institution. So then I was headhunted from Barcelona to go to Lisbon to start up the Oceanario de Lisboa. So I should say the Ukrainian Barcelona is called L'Aquarium de Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> and then Fairly the, obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I was recruited to go to the Oceanario de Lisboa, which is, the, uh, which is in Lisbon. And it was... I've got to say, a spectacular project. It was the centerpiece pavilion for the World Expo, but always intended to be a large aquarium permanent fixed uh, institution. And I actually still sit on their technical board and uh, have a good relationship with them, of course. One of the people I recruited out of university, João Falcato, he's now the CEO and is just a, an absolute rock star, fantastic. He could be making all these names up, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't know. He, I could be. <laughs> uh, so that was, and that was a wonderful project to work on. And I just love Portugal. I think Portugal is a really a hidden jewel. It's a, just a gorgeous city. So I was actually in, at, in Lisbon for seven years in the end. After the first couple of years, the project was running, doing well. And I said to the, the governing body at the time, and it was Parque des Nassoich, didn't make that up, and, uh, which means the, the Park of Nations. Park is in the soil. We'll be checking all this. Uh, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So they said, no, 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 Mark, we want you to stay to build international relations and, and build the reputation of the organisation. And, and so I stayed for seven years and it was a fantastic time. And then I just by chance, while I was there, I met the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, 
in Lisbon. So she's coming through the aquarium and I was showing her around, of course. And I didn't know this at the time, but she's, she's a very uh, successful entrepreneur business woman who she was the chancellor of the university and she said, I've got to get this guy somehow. So she wanted me to come to Massachusetts in the USA to start up a, a, a science literacy centre that had living exhibits as part of it. So that was the uh, Ocean Explorium. And the, really the job of that institution was to work with this group called the Centre for Uni University Schools and Partnerships and NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, to try this new technology called the Science on a Sphere, which is essentially a two-metre two diameter sphere on which you project images of the Earth, but not just a map. You can show uh, real-time algae blooms in the oceans or uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's all sorts of things you can show on this sphere, and it's an incredibly powerful educational tool. But my job was to, again, recruit and build a team that that tried this technology and then married it up with live exhibits and STEM uh, learning for this part of uh, the USA. And that was a, another great project to work on. Did that for five years. And then I was headhunted from that job to go to the New England Aquarium in Boston as the director of life sciences there for that, for that project. And that's... It's not the largest aquarium in the world, but boy, does it do some amazing, amazing work. There's, uh, I think at its, at its height when I was there, and it's not, it's not sort of <laughs> fallen from this, but certainly I'm not sure if this is the exact numbers now, but at the time I was there, there were 21 postdocs working full-time on conservation biology that were hired by the, by the Newman Aquarium. There's no other institution in the world that comes even close to that. And it's a lot to do with Boston being a university town, a financial uh, centre for the USA, and a lot of philanthropy. And, uh, and also a lot to do with the director, John Mandelman, who's a fantastic guy as well. He's, the, he's actually the VP of, of research there. Um, and it, it was a real privilege to work at that institution. I was there for five years. Uh, loved working there. Again, still have really good relations there, still work with some of the team there on, on a variety of things. And uh, throughout that time, I also consulted or have consulted on about roughly 50 projects in different parts of the world. And that can be anything from just giving advice on the kinds of animals that would be appropriate to giving advice on operations, uh, all the way through to full design from zero right through to completion of a project. It just, you know, di different levels for different projects. Um, so that's how I ended up working on all these projects around the world in different things. So, yeah, it's, it's been a really, a really rich career. I wouldn't say I'm a very wealthy man financially. <laughs> But I've had a very, very rich life and, and uh, my, my wife and my daughter have been very supportive throughout all of that. And uh, so you may ask why I came to Adelaide. <laughs> it's one of my main questions, like knowing all of that history or knowing bits of all of that history, it always brings me back yeah. to why Adelaide? It's the only reason he wanted you on the show. Yeah. The <laughs> and it's just for me, it's not like... <laughs> so I, uh, it is a really... Uh, uh, it's not mundane, but it's it's an, uh, a rather non-career oriented answer, I guess. I, I guess we should put into perspective that Adelaide Zoo, beautiful zoo, I think it's got five or six fish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. So it comes down to my wife and I wanted our daughter to finish her schooling years in Australia, and. We wanted it to be in a, a slightly larger city so that she had access to the resources that that offers. And I think we also just had a bit of an attraction for this part of the world. We like Adelaide and we like South Australia and we like Adelaide too. I mean, they're, you know, they're all that sort of that combination of things. And I do continue to work on other projects and I'm on the board of a couple of 
other organisations. I'm on the board of a not-for-profit that does work in the Philippines, for example. So I still do that work, but obviously my core duties and my full-time, I'll, I'll say 40 days a week, loosely, <laughs> yeah. is is actually really focused on managing the team at the Adelaide Zoo. And I really I really love that job and, I, and the team are fantastic and uh, there's a lot of a lot of work yet to do. There's a lot of improvements to make. But when you're working at an institution, as, as you guys would know, you're constantly looking for the things that need improvement and you it tends to deflect you away from all of the successes and all the great things about the organisation you work. And actually that's true, I think, of the industry as a whole. We tend to look for the warts and not celebrate the successes and we're very bad at looking in the rearview mirror and saying, "Yeah, that was a that was a really good outcome, and that's a good that's a good improvement." Um, but I guess that sort of forward momentum is is how improvements come about. So it's just I guess it's just part of that dynamic. And I, I recently, we had the the CEO and the director of the Prague Zoo come and visit Adelaide Zoo with their head of in situ conservation, and they just loved it. They just they, and the Prague Zoo is a is a impressive, affluent, high functioning organisation on a global level, and they supported us and also the efforts on Kangaroo Island after the Kangaroo Island fires. They actually raised a lot of money and and they helped support us in doing that work. So they came to visit to see the Adelaide Zoo and to go to Monado Safari Park and to go to Kangaroo Island where they did the where the work was done. And they were really they were obviously very gracious, but they were sincerely complimentary about all the good things they saw. So of course I'm looking for what what, what have we done wrong? How could we do better? And they're and they're celebrating, wow, that's such a good idea. We should do that and we're gonna mm. we're gonna take that with us and we're gonna do that. And uh, they're taking away all the good things that they see. And they don't really see the, the warts that we see. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic. But when you see that kind of situation unfold, you realise we're so lucky to work in these kinds of organisations and work with the animals we work with. And uh, just, one little, just one little vignette from that. The, they, they had never heard of nor seen quokkas. <laughs> So we, we went to where we have our quokkas and we actually had a quokka joey in pouch, but coming in and out a little bit. They were absolutely mesmerised. So we got the CEO and the director lying full prone with their cameras, <laughs> taking photos of the quokkas, and you could see going through their minds, how do we get some of these back to yeah. the Czech Republic? How are we going to do that? And you've never seen the baby since. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have, we have, but <laughs> there were a few nervous moments. <laughs> That's fun. There's a lot of people in Australia that don't know what quokkas are. We've, we've got quokkas and we show of people course. quokkas. And, but if you say a quokka, they go, okay. But if you say the smiley one, they go, ah, oh, the smiley. They've seen that oh, all over Instagram, yes. the yeah. smiley ones. Yeah. Um, Mark, that's such an impressive career. I mean, I love... Obviously, all the husbandry and expertise you have in keeping these animals alive, which we'll, we'll come to a bit more of in a moment, but the fact that you've incorporated education and research um, all the way along, that's amazing. Yeah, I think nowadays that's almost a given. Like, we don't even... It's sort of second nature, but way back in the day when I first started, so in the, in the late 80s, it wasn't really so commonplace when I suggested it. It was considered a good idea but not really acted on and uh, so it's, it's amazing in really just well now three decades how far the whole industry has come and and our attendant with that of course is our understanding of animal welfare animal cognition animal care has advanced amazingly in that in that time as well and uh, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier before the podcast, mm. and Steve and I were looking around, I, I think the the capacity of the uber hobbyist is finally starting to be more acknowledged because I think there's there's often been a sort of an at arm's length relationship, and I and I've always thought that that was misdirected and 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 actually un, untrue that there, that there's any difference. Um, I mean, there are some important differences that are good 
but I think the, the there's a bit of a an elitism. I think that zoological parks and aquariums and fauna parks with our oh, well, we don't we don't truck with the hobbyists, and, uh, and in fact, as you would all know, as you would know, in many many cases, there are species that are managed by hobbyists far better than they they uh, historically were kept in zoos and aquariums, and it's those skills that have come into zoos and aquariums from the hobby. And that cross-pollination is so, so, so valuable. And I think also true of aquaculture and other... There's a whole range of industries that they sort of all rub up, rub up against each other and they can all benefit so much from working with each other. And I think I, we're seeing yeah. more of that now. I think you're absolutely right. But again, we did touch on it earlier, like the, the, the difference between me as a <laughs> python breeder, boa breeder as well in, in the UK, um, I've got way more freedom to do what I want to do with my animals than a zoo institution has nowadays and um, there, there's definite plus points to, to you know you guys yeah. being governed a bit and uh, etc but um, I think there's sometimes is negatives to it as well yeah I, I, funny, I think one of the things that would real drivers is just economics mm. that if you are a hobbyist you have more latitude to experiment and spend a little bit more money on an idea or a technology or a device than you would under normal circumstances at a zoo or an aquarium, particularly on smaller scale things like terraria. You could, you know, a, a new kind of light comes out, for example, an LED light that is reported to have the capacity to produce a certain spectrum. You can give it a try. And Early on, when that technology first starts out, obviously it's generally more expensive too before it begins, it be, gets more mass produced and rolled out. You have more latitude to try that kind of thing out. Uh, so that, in, in that sense, I've been very um, happy to collaborate with hobbyists and, and try and uh, give those sorts of things a bit of a mm. try. You know, we, we kill our animals so that you don't kill yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> make that a T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a good example, though. I, um, there's a company called Abiz in Germany, uh, and, the, and the engineer who, who builds their equipment, which is pumps, water pumps, actually DC-based water pumps. Uh, Alex Gra is the uh, director and engineer. And Alex and I became... Well, I met him at a, a sort of a trade conference. We became friendly. And he was wanting to try his new equipment, these new pumps, in a, in a larger setting like a public aquarium. And I'm like, absolutely, let's do it. So we did a trial with the uh, DC pump versus AC pump in one of our quarantine facilities at the New England Aquarium. And we had 17 of our AC pumps replaced with his DC pumps. Out of 28, I believe I'm saying that correctly or reporting that faithfully. And in... We then we obviously we did we measured energy consumption before and after water temperatures before and after a whole range of things, and what we worked out was to run those seventeen DC pumps for a year instead of using AC pumps. It was like taking taking two and a half cars off the road. Hmm. Wow! For the energy consumption and the CO two production required to generate that energy. So uh, they, they consume, you know, like about 20% of what an AC pump does for the same load. Actually, at the time, when I was wanting to do this experiment, I actually approached a board member who I knew was really interested in this kind of thing, and the board member was very generous and gave $20,000 to actually do the trial. And now Abyss pumps are just rolling out across the industry and they're being copied and uh, they're already in Australia. Um, But this was very early on when he he was first trialling them out and uh, it was just really nice to work with someone in a a related industry and and sort of just ground through something and and get it it rolling. Mm. And and that's a real revolution. And as you would know, in, in... Aquariums, terrariums, keeping animals, there have been sort of these little incremental revolutions in, in one of them was LED lights, obviously. Which is now coming into the reptile yeah, hobby yeah. at the moment. Absolutely, and you know, because you used to use HQI, metal halides, uh, like really, really hot mm. lamps that consume a lot of energy to get the right spectrum of light. And we're really at the very, I wouldn't say at the early stages, we're sort of a good few years into it now, 
but LED lights are really coming into their own. So you can generate the same spectrum or close to it without nearly the energy consumption and without nearly the temperature, uh, like the heat generation. Mm. And the same with uh, Alex's pumps, the Abyss pumps. They, most pumps cool themselves by dumping heat into the water that's passing through them. If it didn't, if the water didn't pass through them, they'd overheat and the pipes would melt and so on. So there's a, some of the energy isn't converted into the rotation of the impeller. Some of it's converted into heat and the heat has to escape and it goes in the water as it passes through the pump. What that results in is that the water temperature in the system goes up. Mm. So if you're keeping temperate species that require colder water, you have to then put energy into the system to push the heat, to push the temperature down. So you're putting energy into the AC pump to move the water, but that's heating the water up. You're putting more energy into the system to push the temperature back down again. And by using the DC pumps, they produce far less heat. The temperature automatically drops a couple of degrees. So you have to uh, use less energy then to put the temperature, to push the temperature down. So you get this sort of double whammy or second order effects that are actually really beneficial. Another one was that the humidity also um, is impacted less by the functioning of that pump. Um, and there's less noise, there's less vibration, there's all of these sort of these secondary effects that ultimately the animals benefit from. Mm. It's a, I mean, it's the um, aquarium industry that have probably brought in the LED lights that's coming into the reptile industry as well at the moment. It may be. I wonder if it started perhaps in horticulture, but certainly, yeah, yeah. certainly aquariums mm. have been early adopters for sure. Mm. Yeah, because obviously uh, live corals, anemones, there's a lot of photosynthetic organisms that rely on a really good uh, faithful representation of the light spectrum. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting future for it, I think, for that side. Because I'd like the uh, LED side for the green tree pythons. Yeah. Because I'd like to give them D3, but the tubes and everything that are available at the moment makes them too hot. Yeah. They put out too yeah. much heat for a green tree python, in my opinion. Like yeah. So when this LED stuff comes out, it's going to be a next level thing. Yeah. So I don't, as you know, I don't have a lot of experience with reptiles, but there are sort of analogous needs for other species and uh, penguins also need a certain amount of uh, the right UV bands. And we were trialling a few options Again, at the New England Aquarium, there's about, we have about 100 penguins. There's about, um, I think, roughly 60-odd jackass penguins, some rock hoppers and some little penguins. And Did you just say jackass penguins? Jackass. Jackass? Because they, <laughs> they're the, the, uh, they're the uh, sphenisked penguins from South Africa, and they bray like a donkey. <laughs> so they're called a jackass penguin. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they, the little penguins particularly, but they're like, they all require an appropriate spectrum of light and a photo period because, of course, they, their hormones are pretty heavily cued by the photo period. And in penguins, the hormones are really important. Like the actual timing of the release of their hormones is really important for when they breed of curing breeding because they have a pretty small breeding season and then when they molt so you have to get the lighting right to make sure that happens in the right sequence so you're talking about indoor penguins penguins indoors or well obviously if you have outdoor uh, exhibits then you you have to sort of simulate that in other ways particularly if you take them out of the natural range uh but yeah i'm talking about penguins that were maintained indoors yep. yeah so and, and there are a variety of different ways you can display penguins of course but a lot of exhibits are indoors because the temperature control is so important, particularly for, for the more polar penguins like um, you know, emperor penguins and king penguins and chin strap penguins and those penguins that are found really only on continental Antarctica. You really need to manage the temperature because they have such narrow tolerances. Like they, they need any one of those species. They could live in temperatures, say, above 5 degrees C, but... Uh, ideally you'd keep them below. I'm going to ask a stupid wow. question. I know what a water heater is, but how do you cool the water? 
uh, a water cooler. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good. I knew one of you guys would know. I, I, I use the term chiller, which is more common in it's Europe. An American and Europe thing. Well, no, it's not American. Is in it fact, not? Uh, uh, when I used to use the word chiller in the USA, they'd laugh because they thought that they'd was... They'd give you a beer. Yeah, that was humorous. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But then they also operate in Fahrenheit, which does my head in. Yeah. Um, when I explain to them about metric and say, you know, one litre of water weighs a kilogram and it takes one kilocalorie to raise it, one degree Celsius, they all look at me as if I've gone crazy. <laughs> so why wouldn't you use that system? You know? <laughs> yeah, um, it's an easy system. <laughs> uh, so they, yeah, it, it's funny. And then I'll say, I'll say, and that weighs that much. How do you know that? Well, I said, it's so many litres. It's salt water. Salt water has a specific gravity of 1.025. Just multiply that. There's how much it weighs. Oh, okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so anyway, um, I, I think that uh, to answer your question, you use a chiller. And that can involve coils, so chilled coils in a system. So like what's in a fridge? Uh, essentially, yeah, yeah. And, you, and you pass it through a chilling device, which is like a refrigerant, it's a refrigerant of some kind. So typically, you have a split unit of some kind that uh, then dumps heat into the environment somewhere by taking the, the energy that, that's in the water out, which is effectively cooling the water and then dumping it somewhere else. I kind of imagined, but I thought I'd ask. Yeah. You're right. A lot of aquariums try to be strategic about where they draw their water and if you draw water from underneath the seabed the water it'll be cooler and you can if you want to have a self-contained system we'll say semi-closed or semi-open as is often referred to you can actually bring water in from the exterior and run it in a heat exchanger um, with the water in the tank itself and so you're actually using cooler water from outside to cool the water inside, if that makes sense, in, in the heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger is essentially a set of laminated plates and the water passes um, across the plates, but the water doesn't actually touch directly. It's a, there's, a, there's a, a transfer of energy from one body of water into the other as it goes through the heat exchanger. Mm. Very hard to describe you did well. In just audio. No. <laughs> <laughs> you did well. Yeah, it's pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, so within like your career, you found the time to write the Bible on keeping cartilaginous fish. Well done. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say the other word. <laughs> Alas, my brain. <laughs> That's also very well done. I didn't obviously write that book single-handedly, <laughs> but you, you are right. I think I was about 10 years into caring for sharks and rays and just again sort of fell in love with those animals and that just passionate about that and as you often do you say well I'd like to learn I want to know more about these animals I've I've got to learn more and so I started looking for the books about how to care for them and I found the sharks of the world which is the uh, it's really a field guide more than anything that describes the species at the very least so we could differentiate between which species or what we were holding but there really wasn't a book on how to care for sharks and rays and after about 10 years as I mentioned I was working with a number of colleagues and I just thought we could we could write this the collective knowledge in these people's heads should be on paper somewhere so newbies who are starting to work in this in this field have access to that so I actually proposed the idea at a conference in Minnesota, I think it was, from memory. And really, there was a, it was actually a conference, an aquarium conference, and there was a really positive response to the idea. And one of the participants, a guy by the name of Doug Warmaltz, he approached me after I presented this idea, and he said, oh, I'd really love to work with this on you, Mark, with, with this, on this project with you, Mark. And... Uh, that sort of struck up a friendship that we maintain to today. He's actually the director of animal care for the Columbus Zoo, which is a zoo in Ohio. And then uh, he and I kind of spearheaded this whole effort and gathered together really people from all around the world to contribute. And we, we basically, <laughs> on the, as you do at a conference, on the back of a napkin, we wrote down all the subjects. Well, okay, how, how from... 
from soup to nuts, how do you actually care for a shark and a ray? And you know, how do you just choose what species you want to maintain? How do you treat the water? How do you catch them? How do you move them? All of that uh, sort of captured all of that. And I think we ended up with about 50 topics. And then we said, well, who's the person we think is the, is the authority on that particular uh, discipline? And we approached them about uh, contributing a chapter. And we we did we did pretty well actually. We got almost everyone we we wanted to get. We we didn't get everyone, but close to it. And one of them is George Benz, who's no longer with us. He is one of the he was one of the world's authorities on shark parasitology. And he said, you know what we could do? We could actually have a conference and get everyone together, and we'll sort of do an informal peer review during the conference to really boost up the chapters and make them even better. So that's what we did. We, we basically had every author present their chapter as a paper, as a sort of presentation. And then they had to submit their manuscripts and we obviously did the editing and the peer review process. And it was published in 2001. One of the things we really wanted to make sure was it was as accessible to everyone as we possibly could. So we approached the... Uh, Packard Foundation, so Julie Packard, who is the chair of the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, and she gave us $50,000 to publish the book outright, and that meant we could actually put the whole thing on the internet free of charge, so you can download the book from the internet as searchable PDFs, and it's... and and. I think last count, I looked at uh, Google Analytics and I think it's been downloaded in something like 105 countries or something. Yeah, wow. yeah. I think I think some people probably download it by mistake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. But, um, uh, so, some, I mean, people can keep some of the um, smaller stingrays in captivity. Is there any sharks people can keep? Well, you can uh, as a you mean as a, a hobbyist at home as a hobbyist. Yeah, yeah there actually are, and uh, there are there are some. Truly, uber hobbyists who, have, who essentially <laughs> essentially have a public aquarium size aquarium in their house. Okay, and they'll often like, there are some people in the, in different parts of the world who have a full time carer of that exhibit in their home. Have you ever been to someone's house and just been blown away? Uh, more than once. Yeah, yeah there's wow. some like there's some really spectacular. And again, because the hobbyists can probably dedicate more resources than would be economically viable unless they have an independent income of some of some kind they can actually take things to the next level and there's something gangster about having a shark isn't it i think that lethal weapon movie yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's this classic sort of almost james bond, james yeah, bond yeah, yeah. <laughs> have a bridge with a with a with a trap door and it goes over the piranha tank <laughs> that kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, Can we yes. do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but certainly, we, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the exhibits that I was involved in doing um, was actually to have a, a, a glass walkway over an exhibit. So you had sharks and rays swimming underneath you. And it was a, a really large tank, so they had plenty of space. But it is really intriguing seeing how people hesitate and then really dig the idea of walking over these animals and, and being... I mean, it's, it's absolutely abundantly clear that the glass is solid and there's no chance of them falling. There's absolutely none. But there's still this visual arresting sense, like, I, I can't cross that. There's, and, yeah. uh, but it actually really adds to the experience, obviously. Yeah, if you walk through Kings Park, is it in Perth? They're, they've got a glass bridge that you walk over and it is quite worrying when you first yeah. step on it so to have sharks underneath you as well <laughs> next level not sure yeah. yeah what is the smallest shark the smallest shark that's a good question thank you i think <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a whole series of really uh deep sea lantern eyed sharks and they're all i think probably the smallest is the cigar shark which is called the cigar shark because it's about the size of a cigar um but there's there are actually dozens, if not possibly hundreds, of really small sharks. Like, there are over 500 species of shark. And uh, there's the one of the ones that's probably more interesting is the cookie-cutter shark. You may have heard of yeah. cookie-cutter shark. 
and their their teeth look like a cookie cutter. I mean, they they actually they get their sustenance by taking cookie cutter chunks out of larger animals. Because those chunks were a mystery for a period of time. They were. They? they were. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Exactly. Yeah, like what's doing this? And they even you know they even have it, a lot of the submarines would coat their like the conning tower and parts of the sensing equipment that they have and I guess the periscope I'm not sure about that but certainly some of the uh, sensing equipment they have they they're often coated in rubber and cookie cutters have actually taken chunks out of those as well (laughs) Um, so yeah they're an intriguing animal but yeah I'd say the cigar shark if you imagine even that cigar shark to something looks like a great white shark (laughs) (laughs) it's all relative well that's so so true and and I think that, just going back to what you were saying, Steve, that, that there's a sort of a visceral fear about certain things. Heights is obviously one of them. Mm. For some people, sharks are. Mm. Not for me. And maybe that's just by constant exposure to sharks. You've never I, seen the movie Jaws? Well, it's a funny story. I have. <laughs> I have. Um, but, yeah, there are some people who just – sharks is – just mm. the worst possible phobia, and they just could not bring themselves to cross an exhibit that, like a, gra- a glass bridge that went over a shark exhibit, just wouldn't be an option. And obviously for arachnophobes, spiders, and, and similar things. So coming back to your question about Jaws, I did see Jaws when I was very young. I was probably fourteen, I think, and it was a really rainy summer beach was out and uh, like it had been raining for weeks so I went and saw Jaws with a friend and uh, just by chance the following day the sun came out and we were we were on holidays at the beach and my mother couldn't believe because she'd also seen Jaws as well that that the following day I was out past the furthest breaker (laughs) and that's that's the power of youth or the, the foolishness of youth I just didn't didn't seem to affect me the way it affected some people because some people were absolutely terrorised by Jaws. <laughs> yeah, well, I saw Jaws, and even at forty four years old, I love like I I take on your passion for as soon as I get out on water, even on a boat, I feel relaxed. If I go snorkeling, I've never done scuba diving because I've never actually got qualified for it, and I would love to do it. It's, it's one of those things I should do one day. But even just snorkeling and putting your head down in the water and looking. But I still think every now and then I hear do do. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you get the water, you hear that. Actually, yeah, that's, yeah. You're like, this is strange. Yeah. Uh, I will say, I, I'm not completely immune to that mm. possibility. And I have been diving on occasions where I've felt a little anxious about the possibility of, like, particularly if it's an area where you know sharks are. And uh, I went diving with a friend actually off the coast of South Africa, specifically for... See, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually driving specifically to, go to see Zambezi sharks, as they call them, Zambezi sharks. And it's a, essentially it's a bull shark, and they are uh, one of the species that is known to attack humans. The water was quite turbid, and we were descending down to the reef where they were known to be. And, yeah, there were a few moments there when... You can't see this. Cause it was turbid enough that you're sort of in a, in a sphere of green because you can't see the surface and you can't see the bottom. And, you, and, and it, what happens is that distance becomes very hard to determine. So you feel immediately that you're in a shroud and you can't see anything and anything could be anywhere near you and you wouldn't know. And, of course, you can see further than you realise. But... Um, I'd say that I probably had a few anxious moments then, uh, but then I saw. Then we we actually got to source, we got to see some Zambezi sharks, and that was uh, the purpose of the trip. Have you actually <laughs> dived with great whites, or I have been in the water with a great white? Uh, I think twice, but not seeking them direct, you know, directly. Uh, and of course, I've been diving um, actually intentionally cage diving here off, off the coast of Port Lincoln to see white sharks. Um, hmm. That wasn't intentional. Yeah. <laughs> And that was, but I was in a cage, and uh, I, I know you can, and and I understand that it's possible to dive with white sharks uh, safely, but I probably would say to anyone listening, if you are in the water and you know there's a white shark in the water, I would encourage you to not 
stay in the water because mm. uh, you just don't know. And I mean, it, it is true that they are an ambush predator. So if you see the white shark, you're at less risk than if you don't see it because they attack from depth at speed and you probably wouldn't know the animal's there if you uh, were attacked by it. You, know, you probably don't see it before you're mm. attacked by it. Mark, why do we make wetsuits the same colour as a seal? Why do we? That's right. <laughs> why aren't they like That's high vis? Point. Everything <laughs> else is high vis. Why aren't we having high vis wetsuits? I think that you've really cottoned onto something there, I think. It's an excellent <laughs> question. You know, it is funny you should say that. There have been a lot of experiments done on, on wetsuit colours for the purposes of avoiding sharks. And one of the uh, attempts was to actually have the coloration of a sea crate, so a sea snake. Right. And the and the uh, the hypothesis there was that sharks would avoid them. Another one is to have uh, blazers on the wetsuit, black and white, like the coloration of a killer whale. Oh, see, I thought it was a zebra because they were scared of zebras. <laughs> <laughs> you never see sharks near zebras. No, so. That's exactly right. That's true. I think very sensible, I think. The, uh, I'd, I'd be avoiding a zebra too, I think. Mm. <laughs> I love zebras, but uh, they, they can be cantankerous. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, that has been trialled. But I don't think with a lot of real success or hard science behind the, the outcome. There was another, you can get shark repellent. One shark repellent's been made from, if you can believe it, ground up other sharks. I think the idea is that uh, that shark is dead. I should avoid this area. I, yeah, there's, there's a whole... The wetsuit made out of ground up shark. No, no, no. Okay. The, the, it's actually no, like a spray on. Spray. It's oh, a, sorry. Gotcha. So you spray yep. yourself before okay. you put the wetsuit on. Yeah, and, and, you, and you're sort of a shark. leaking out... <laughs> Uh, dead shark smell. It sounds like it would have quite the opposite effect. Well, uh, obviously, <laughs> I mean, obviously, tuna blood or some other animal blood would not be wise, of course. Mm. Um, so they must have proven that sharks can tell the difference. Well, you'd assume this, the, the, the proven part of that. I'm not sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Assumed. Yeah. And there's another there's another uh, technology which you may have heard of or seen called the shark pod, which is essentially an electron. A magnetic pulse that repels sharks because sharks have a, a very finely tuned and very sensitive uh, sense of electrical fields. So they have this organ that's sort of around the head called the ampullae of Lorenzini and it can detect very, very, very faint electrical uh, signals. For example, the bonnet head shark, which is the smallest of the hammerhead sharks, it detects its prey by scanning the substrate and it can detect the heartbeat of fish hidden in the sand. Yeah. And wow. it uses that electrical sense to be able to detect it's it. It's a bit so, like a platypus. Yeah, very similar. So they're very, very sensitive to uh, electrical impulses and the shark pod basically releases a, a pulse of electromagnetic uh, pulse that is it's kind of like putting a bucket on your head and hitting it with a hammer like it really it, it's it's like blinding the shark's electrical sense and they find it really disagreeable and they try and avoid it but it also relies on you know the inverse square law so the, the further you get away from the source the field diminishes very rapidly and for a white shark that's an ambush predator it, it it's already on the victim before it would detect the electrical field. So for some, in some cases it can work, but it's not uh, an absolute um, knockdown winner in every case. So, so good luck to the people on the dolphin boat. Yeah, I mean, you can get, so the shark pod can go inside a surfboard and yeah, mm. they can often, they put I think they throw something out, don't they, when you're doing the dolphin. Yeah, they do, and, they, and I would say it probably, probably, like, those, it probably yeah. is one of those, or, or, a, or a variation on that idea. Mm. Mm. They're pretty quick, aren't they? Very, very quick. And, and white sharks, again, this is a sort of a quirk of nature which you guys would be familiar with. They're counter-shaded. Yes. So we learned that from Steve, Steve Batchel. Batchel. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, so white sharks are a really good example of a counter-shaded uh, predator species. They're black on top or dark on top, white underneath. If you look down on the water onto the sea floor, they're hard to see because they're dark. If you look up from underneath, yeah. they're hard to see because they're white against the relatively white surface of the water. Uh, so, they're, yeah, they're 
very, very cool animals. They are pretty amazing. Chance. There's not been any success with keeping great whites in captivity, has there? There has been some success, but actually, I'll, I'll more correctly answer that question. You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> but there has been some success. And in fact, in the second volume of the Elasma Brank Husbandry Manual, <laughs> there's a, the first chapter is by a friend, Manny Oscura, and uh, some co authors on the efforts to keep white sharks alive at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And they, like the Monterey Bay Aquarium is really the sort of the mecca for public aquaria. It is a fabulous institution. And the Packard family and Julie Packard set it up. And they set up the research foundation associated with it and they just do spectacular work. I had the real fortune to work with them on a couple of projects as well. And they decided we're going to try and keep white sharks in an aquarium there it was called the outer bay exhibit i think it's now just the open ocean exhibit and this exhibit very very large but it was shaped like half an egg so it was a sort of a hemisphere so there were no uh right angle corners on the exhibit and then they have introduced water into that exhibit in a way that generates a sort of uplift current that keeps uh, the animals aloft and also something for the animals to swim against which is really appropriate for pelagic fish species so then they launched an expedition to collect a young of the year white shark so about a metre long white shark and I think over the time that they they did this over about a period of 13 years they, they collected about 7 or 8 sharks and they would put them on display in the aquarium, which was obviously very popular, as you can mm-hmm. imagine. It generated a lot of interest. And they successfully maintained those animals for about a year for each of the, we'll call them uh, young of the year. And then they'd get to a size where they would outgrow the exhibit, essentially. And this was a large exhibit. And so they would then tag the white shark and release it back into the wild. And they would spend a lot of money and energy and resources on launching each of those expeditions. They would go down to the shark pupping grounds. They would catch a a young of the year, put it into a large floating cage, which was then slowly towed up the coastline to outside the aquarium and then move that animal into the... And after they, again, they sort of did this for about a decade or so, they and in, and in parallel with that, they had a lot of work, a lot of research work on the um, energetics of the animals, the species. They were already doing a lot of work on the energetics of tuna as a sort of a an analog for what happens with pelagic sharks. And over that whole time, like again, it's about a decade. They had multiple conferences on the conservation biology of white sharks, and really advanced the science a lot. And at the end of that, they came to the conclusion that with all the energy and effort that they had used and the resources they had used, they were able to maintain the animals for about a year, but that was about it. And that their welfare of the animals ultimately would not uh, benefit if they kept them any longer. And they decided collectively as a group, actually, to maintain this species in Aquaria, at least with the facilities that they have, which are some of the best in the world, probably isn't ethical mm. and we should not continue to do that. We've learned a lot, we've advanced the science and we're going to now just say we won't collect any more white sharks and we'll just support more research on the species. And uh, So that was, I think that was up until about the mid-noughties roughly they were doing that work or maybe, the, maybe into the tens. And they've also since trialled some other species, other pelagic species, like the oceanic white tip shark, which is just a beautiful species. I one, snorkeled with those, I think. One of my favourites. Mm. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, and also thresher sharks. And they have, and, and threshers, they had very similar challenges as white sharks. In fact, I think they're even more challenging than white sharks. They're a very, very pelagic species. And then with the oceanic white tip, the divers and the team who worked with the animals at, at the aquarium, they said that they were more intimidated by, and we'll say scared of, 
the oceanic white tip than they were of the white shark in the aquarium. They said that animal is just so powerful, fast, and I think unpredictable that they were just really, yeah. <laughs> really, really careful around that shark. They're yeah. not even that big, are they? <laughs> no, no. They, well, they, they can grow to be big, but they weren't that big mm. in the aquarium. But they, yeah, they, and you would see they, I had the fortune of actually seeing both those species in the aquarium and then being fed by the team. And what looks, what it is, is a really, really large aquarium suddenly becomes very, very small mm. when these animals accelerate and they can just move around that tank in an instant it's uh, and stop in an instant like just tilt their tilt their pectoral fins up to their wing like fins and just stop and yeah amazing amazing, amazing. so do they the sharks actually really basic question i don't know the answer to do they actually sleep ha. well like a lot of animals they do go through a, a sort of a torpor uh, so they don't Sleep in the sense that they, um, you know, they shut their eyes and not off like humans mm, snore <laughs> and snore. <laughs> but they definitely do go through phases of uh, lower activity and and uh, reduce consciousness. We'll say like reduce levels of consciousness. And uh, sharks, again, this is just a a quirk of evolutionary biology that I just love. And actually, it's an area I did a lot of work on. And to, there's, uh, one of the chapters in the book is on how to move sharks around successfully, which I was the senior author on. And it's one of the key parts of that is this aspect of shark biology, which is this idea that uh, this fellow Jarrett Clay came up with in 1977, that sharks have adopted a strategy which is referred to as the swim glide hypothesis. And what that means is that the shark actively swims for a period of time and then it passively glides for a period of time. So the pectoral fins on a shark are like the wings of an aeroplane. They have the same, almost the same profile. So they give the shark lift in the water, like an aeroplane's wings. So with the forward momentum of the shark going through the water, the fins give them lift. Hmm. But the forward momentum comes from the tail and they expend energy to move their tail. So what the hypothesis says is that the shark can actively swim with its tail and get lift from the fins, from the pectoral fins, and then it pauses or stops actively pushing its tail back and forth and therefore not expending as much energy, and it glides for a period of time. And, you know, up to about 50% of the energy is required to adopt that strategy versus mm. constantly swimming all the time. Because you would have heard the idea that some sharks would die if they stopped swimming. Is that because they don't have operculums over their gills like fish do? Yeah, it's, it's in some ways sort of related. So some sharks clearly can live without swimming because they're bottom dwelling sharks mm. like uh, leopard sharks and mm. uh, all sorts of cat sharks and no problems at all and they don't have an operculum but they have a sort of a variation on the operculum which is uh, like some bo- uh, bottom dwelling sharks and rays have a spiracle where they draw water in through the top of their head or close to the top of their head and out, the, out, out their gills gill slits So uh, what you've highlighted is one of the differences between most bony fishes and sharks, which is the bony fishes have one hard gill cover called the operculum, whereas sharks will have uh, five gill slits, or in some cases like six or seven gill sharks, six or seven gill slits. And in one way, that's how sharks, although they're sort of considered the tough hombres of uh, of the ocean world, they're quite sensitive, and a good impact against their gill slits can actually damage their gills. Whereas with a, with a fish, they've got a bony cover and that sort of protects it a little bit. So with, with sharks, when they... So some sharks can lie on the bottom and they're perfectly happy. But there are a group of sharks, many of them are referred to sort of group, grouped as the mackerel sharks. They do have to keep swimming to be able to extract oxygen from the water almost exclusively or almost all the time there's some variations on that idea but those sharks include the likes of the white shark the mako shark the thresher the mackerel shark Um, so they actually have a lot more red muscle tissue 
have a much higher demand for oxygen. And if they stop swimming, they will suffer oxygen death. So when you're moving sharks around the world, which, which is one of the things I've done, you have to simulate the shark swimming while it's in a very small space. And so you can use water currents and oxygenated water to blow across or into their mouth and out their gills, which is simulating that animal moving forward through the water. And if you don't do that, they, they suffer oxygen death. And uh, in, in many ways, again, evolutionarily speaking, they have developed this really, really finely tuned energetic balance that can get very easily knocked out of whack. And then they can, they can die if that happens, obviously. So, uh, yeah. although they're sort of the tough ombres of the ocean, they're actually very, very vulnerable to some very, very small changes. Mm. Do, you, do you actually move sharks around from country to country? Then? Yeah, I guess we, they'd have to at some point. Yeah, carry on. yeah. yeah I've, I've, I've flown sharks uh, all over the place. Actually, I mean, all over the place. I've flown sharks from Australia to China, from the tip of South Africa all the way to Europe. From wow. uh, yeah. It's, it's not something you imagine, like a mammal or a no, reptile is quite easy, no. isn't it? But. <laughs> I, again, this is again, going back in the day a bit, uh, we moved some sharks from Cape Town to Lisbon in Portugal. So it's, it's a good flight. It's a long way. We actually had a stopover in Lagos, not someone you, somewhere you'd normally stop. <laughs> <And it laughs> what was, did you and the shark get up to? <laughs> 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 only sort of thing, the only thing you... The sort of thing you could only get away with in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Christ, that left that open, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> so, yeah, to, to do that, we uh, South African Airways were the carrier, and this was not a it wasn't a passenger flight. Of all things, they were carrying pilchards, twenty five tons of pilchards, and two sharks. <laughs> Two live sharks. So the, the pilchards were frozen. And uh, Spain is a really big consumer of seafood. And those pilchards were destined for San Sebastian in, in the north of Spain. They were going to stop over in Lisbon on the way and, and let our two sharks off. And, and that's off. So to do that, they gutted the interior of this 747 and they are massive inside. Mm. You don't realise until when all the decks are taking out, they are, it's like a football stadium. They're massive, mm. absolutely massive. And uh, 25 tonnes of pilchard sounds like a lot. It didn't take up very much of the plane, only a very small part of the plane, and then these two sharks, and then just empty. <laughs> so that was the value of the pilchards. That's, yeah, how, wow. that's how valuable yeah. it was to, to that part of Spain. So we are flying across... Africa in this jet and the captain well, we're the, like, actually almost in the tail of the plane, we're right at the back of the plane and sort of halfway along the plane you've got one crew in sleeping bags asleep on the floor of the plane and then you go up a couple of stairs like uh, all the spiral staircase up into the cockpit and the captain came down and he was really fascinated by the sharks asking us all sorts of questions oh, this is really cool, wow, yeah and, and he was really into it and he said to me, turns to me and says would you like to fly an aeroplane? Mm. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> and he, so he took me up into the cockpit and he actually sat me in the captain's seat and I grabbed the controls wow. of the plane and obviously the co-pilot was right there beside me. But that, that would never happen today. <laughs> Occupational health and safety is yeah, such that right. you know, I wouldn't even be able to Although in a cockpit. flight like that, it possibly would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so to do that, can you imagine trying to keep a shark alive in, in a box about the size of the table we're sitting at right now? And you've got to treat the water so that the water remains uh, healthy and the water parameters are, are good. And pH is probably one of the biggest things that you have to manage, but also ammonia. So ammonia is a byproduct of metabolism for all animals and particularly fishes. And in the case of sharks, it just passively diffuses out their gills into the water. And over time, it becomes toxic. It grows to a concentration that it becomes toxic. So you have to have some mechanism to strip out the ammonia, some mechanism to keep the pH up so it doesn't, the water doesn't become too acidic. 
and you need to keep the water oxygenated so there's plenty of oxygen for the animals to extract oxygen from the water sharks have really very low blood pressure and only a two-chambered heart so circulation is pretty low so ideally you'd also have the shark moving a little bit or manipulating it so it can move which helps the venous return like our lymphatic system for humans is in, in sharks similarly it helps move blood through the system and you have to sort of simulate all of that while you are flying across Africa with a shark in a box <laughs> and and then the other thing you can do is that one of the things they suffer like any animal that is hyperactive uh, is that they consume all their glucose reserves glycogen is mobilized from the liver that gets consumed and then they start to suffer from lack of sugar in the bloodstream so lack of sugar and carbon dioxide build up you sort of have all sorts of really bad biochemical things happening in the body of the animal so you can actually also and, and we did that in this case you can introduce glucose to the system intravenously as well so like a drip bag that you would see in er you have a drip bag full of glucose actually add sodium bicarbonate to that glucose to help counteract any um, acidity in the body of the animal and you can deliver that to the animal intravenously so you're doing all that to keep the animal alive on the transport while well, you're flying the plane oh, you're well, right. yeah. <laughs> it's distracted by flying that's, the plane yeah. that's yeah that's insane yeah so that was successful yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> it was it was no yeah. not at all steve no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely those two animals went got to lisbon and then i at the time i was i was actually approached to do that project with this fellow from south africa for for a project i wasn't working on uh, but the agreement was that once that project was done, after three years, the sharks would come to the Barcelona Aquarium, which indeed happened. Wow. Have you ever kept sharks at home? I've never kept sharks at home. Do you keep any fish at home? Have you got aquariums? I don't. I have kept animals. Like I, when I was a boy, my house was a bit of a menagerie. Um, but as soon as I started working at SeaWorld, I really kind of kept the animals at the institutions I worked and not at home. Mm. And it wasn't, I don't know, I don't think it was even an active decision. I just felt like that should be my focus. Um, I mentioned earlier I I had kept a diamond python. Diamond python, um, yeah. But that was really more of a a birthday present for a girlfriend at the time, uh, more than anything. (laughs) Um, so yeah I, uh, diamonds are a girl's best friend uh, yeah, exactly uh-huh. yeah, exactly <laughs> um, yeah so I didn't I, I don't I haven't really kept animals at home uh, since I started working in the industry really mm. and I don't really have a good reason why that is I think again I think it's just been the focus on on what's happening at the place of work more than anything and I think moving around to you know we lived in Barcelona Mm. in the old gothic quarter for for uh, three years and there's no reason why i couldn't have had some aquariums in in that house but my focus was really getting the aquarium up and running yeah i understand it if i, I think if i was doing that full time i wouldn't have obviously all these animals at home if yeah. i was doing that as a living because mm. yeah. i do do it as a living but mm. <laughs> mm. but can i say barcelona beautiful city gorgeous Adelaide's the, probably the nicest city in the world maybe Edinburgh is my favourite but yeah Barcelona amazing Barcelona Zoo is awesome yeah, I is. went to Barcelona Zoo when they still had the, the big white mountain gorilla yes yeah which is yeah. just an amazing zoo really cool so if someone's listening Mark and they want to get a games room with some sharks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, which this, this show is really honed in on conservation and I'm not normally the captive guy, but I'm just really curious. Is there a species that would lend itself? What's a decent, cool-looking shark? I'm sorry, I sound so ridiculous yeah, right now. But I know, I know. <laughs> um, is, there, is there like a mini great white shark that gets to like under a meter that you could have in captivity that looks awesome? Yeah, it's a, it is a good question. And uh, you'd answer it in a few ways. I think they're a, they're a tiger. I, I'm a little, <laughs> which is kind of in, implicit in the way you ask the question. You really have to be careful about encouraging people to keep animals that they probably shouldn't be keeping, or they don't. 
although they would have very good intentions, they may not have the capacity to keep. So I say this advisedly. When people think of a shark, they think of a shark that's, that's sort of free swimming and looks very sharky. And a lot of sharks that you could keep in aquariums would be things like brown banded bamboo shark, for example, uh, which is a bottom dwelling shark. They, they're very gratifying because they breed and uh, that's very cool. And, but it also presents another whole set of problems, which is that you can have a, sur- a surplus of those animals in the hobby, which is not a good thing. But, yeah, I think it's, it, it's really valuable for a young person to see the life cycle. Uh, some sharks lay eggs, and you can see the embryo developing in the egg, which is also just a remarkable thing to see. Because you can sort of... That you would have seen um, what's referred to as mermaid purses on the beach. That's actually a shark's egg. And you can sort of scrape the fuzz away from the shark's egg. And if it's backlit, you can see the embryo developing with the umbilicus attached to the uh, yolk sac and it's it's a really really good sort of biological stem learning opportunity really yeah. really very cool is that the port jackson yeah port jackson's have that yeah, there's this is more corkscrew shaped mm, which is quite strange you never cool. you'd never pick it as an egg no you absolutely <laughs> wouldn't and then they 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 lay their eggs and then they kind of because it's corkscrew corkscrew shape and then they sort of screw it into a rock so it anchors it which is very cool whereas a lot of the others are more sort of ovoid with tendrils and they'll lay the egg and then they'll sort of wind it around some seagrass or something and the tendrils get tangled and that anchors the egg to the seafloor. The sharks do that with their nose or something do they? Yeah they'll, they'll push they'll use their nose they'll push through some seagrass and then the tendrils will get trapped and it'll actually help pull the egg out of the shark that, that kind of thing. So to come back to your question, one species that looks very sharky and is small-ish and can be maintained in aquaria would be the uh, black-tipped reef shark. But again, I'd be really, you know, you'd have to, you have to really know what you're doing to keep them well and you need a, a really decent sized exhibit. So some people who have very, very significant means can build an aquarium that could maintain those animals in in good welfare conditions like in a good way but anything much larger i mean you you get to larger free swimming sharks and it that really is the domain of the public aquarium and and in some cases they shouldn't be kept at all Mm. you know and it's really hard to thread that ethical needle you have to really know the animals well to know what their needs are both um, sort of biologically, cognitively, and what you can provide as a carer. And I think another part that sort of layers in on top of that is what it, what is the purpose of maintaining that animal? You know, is it is it for education? Is it for research? Ego. Are those claims legitimate? <laughs> if it's for ego, uh, I think you have to stop and question, is that the best way to express your ego? Because you're absolutely right. That's I, I why think, people would want a shark. Yeah, <laughs> sure. No, I think a lot of people... And, and a python. And not just sharks and pythons. I, you know, I think uh, big cats is another classic for, for that. And um, I think almost any animal. Uh, I mean, there, of course, you have really impassioned hobbyists who just love for whatever reason, they've mm. fallen in love with amphibians, for example, which are very, very cool. And their passion for maintaining those animals is much more about curiosity, I think, and not so much ego. But they, I'm sure there's an egoist out there who keeps dart frogs because you make, you know, you can take curare from them and kill people with it. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. all sorts of yeah. funny, funny rationales. But you I need I, the I, ants, though, don't you, for them to eat to get the poison. Right, exactly. You didn't, you didn't, they, they, they won't know that. Adelaide Zoo don't have poison dart frogs, they just have dart frogs. <laughs> 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 um, that's a really good answer. I love that answer, Mark. Thanks for explaining that. Mm. It's a highly specialised thing, and even for the sm- some of the yeah. smaller things, it'd have to be highly specialised. I think mm. it's good just to go sort of strip back your assumptions to really to the studs and just say well what is the rationale mm. why would i keep this animal and and just one part of it that i didn't add which was what's the conservation status of that animal so um there is a bit of a i guess a drive or a motivation out there in some cases and, and you guys again will be attuned to this that people want to keep an animal because it's rare 
And that could be the very worst motivation for wanting to keep that animal. If taking that animal from the wild is going to have a significant impact on the recruitment of that species in its natural habitat, that's a really bad idea. Mm. So uh, I think, I would say, again, much of the hobby is very ethical about that. And, you know, in, in particularly in trade magazines talking about the hobby, there are lots of stories about conservation and how the hobby can contribute towards conservation. Mm. Like how do you, where can you source sustainable animals? An example of that would be the Project Piaba fishes, which are fishes that are taken from the Amazon Delta, which floods every year. And so there's this explosion in population of, for example, cardinal tetras and you know, a whole range of other species. And extracting animals from the wild there does absolutely nothing to the recruitment of that species in its natural habitat. On the contrary, it actually shines a light on the natural history of that species, but also the impacts of things like deforestation and so on on that region, and the hobby are really attuned to that. And that's, a, that's a really good thing. So knowing the provenance of the species and knowing why, what, what's the rationale for keeping that species. And so the, with Project Piaba, you, you get a fish and you know who collected it, where they live, how they are sustaining their family, how the fish trade in that area is preserving the habitat because they are highly motivated to prevent loggers from coming in and deforesting the area. And that's a really coherent, good story and motivation for taking those animals. Mm, yeah, it's kind of the FSC to fish forestry commission yeah. <laughs> stewardship kind of thing for fish. Some of these sharks can live a long time, can't they? That's a really good question. Um, yes, they can. So the sleeper shark, the Pacific sleeper shark and the sleeper shark, they've done work on that species, which they use uh, bomb radio dating. So when the atomic bombs were detonated in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that aerosolized certain isotopes, atomic isotopes, went into the atmosphere and then obviously got incorporated into the environment and into the tissue of some organisms. And in sleeper sharks, I think, in, in many organisms, the cornea of the eye is preserved. It's not replaced. So it actually is like a, a mechanism in combination with the isotopes, the atmospheric isotopes that have been incorporated into the tissue to actually date the animals or age the animals. And that species lives, they estimate, based on, on that data and also extrapolation of uh, length, weight, uh, curves and so on, lives for about 250 years. Wow. <laughs> and, and estimate that they don't become sexually mature until they're about 60. <laughs> That's the sleeper shark. Yeah. That's wow. amazing, yeah. Right. And they vary, they're, they're a large shark. I think they, I'm right in saying this, they're the third largest shark after the whale shark and the white shark I believe think about that oh no sorry the, the uh, whale shark and the basking shark I should say and they're very very slow moving sort of uh, scavenger sharks and uh, they obviously live um, in cooler water but very, yeah, very cool very cool species that's awesome and, and sharks are an ancient species too aren't well they? of course yeah so they are very very ancient and, and that's Going back to the point about their really fine-tuned fine, fine -tuned, um, energetics, it's been a really successful model for that group of animals because they have just persisted throughout um, evolutionary time for uncountable millions of years and you know, relatively unchanged. Like looking at the fossilised evidence, they've remained very similar in body form and shape. And uh, yeah. How do we look at fossilised evidence of a shark? Well, that's, a good question. that's another <laughs> good question. So some of that tissue, even though... Uh, so uh, I think we've talked about this prior to the podcast. The sharks raise skates and chimeras. Their skeleton is made of cartilage rather than bone. When we think of fossils, we, we think of very much of it being bones that are preserved and uh, we don't really think so much about other tissues being preserved but you can still preserve other tissue just far less frequently and you have to have obviously the, the absolute right conditions for that to happen 
also the some of the precursors of sharks is a group called the placoderms. They had very sort of big bony plates, but they had a very similar sort of fusiform shape and and jaws and and so they they're very sort of very close relatives. And the other thing about it's interesting about sharks is their skin. They have a type of scale called a denticle, which is essentially like a little miniature tooth. So if sharks weren't scary enough, <laughs> their whole skin is teeth. <laughs> and if you do it, if you take it, they're, they're very, very small. They're quite, quite almost microscopic. If you look really closely at the shark's skin, you can see individual uh, denticles. And if you do a cross-section through the denticle, it's like a tooth. It's got enamel and pulp, uh, just like a tooth has. And uh, prehistoric sharks had much larger sort of plates, like I said, the placoderms, like these big bony plates. And uh, over time, you know, this is very broadly speaking, they become smaller and more, and the sharks become more flexible and the plates have become tiny in the form of these denticles. What's really interesting about the denticles, though, this is another cool aspect of their evolution, Depending on where the body of the shark that that denticle is, the shape of the denticle is a little bit different. So underneath its pectoral fins, the wing-like fins, they're one shape. Behind their eyes, they're a different shape. Under their tail, they're a different shape. And the flow of water over the shark is laminar flow. It actually, the denticles are formed such that the turbulence and the drag of the animal passing through the water is minimized because of the shape of the denticles. So you look at it at a microscopic yeah. level, it looks like a really rough sandpapery coarse terrain, but actually that minimizes drag for the animal to pass through the water and again is a way of it preserving energy. That's amazing. Well, I mean, all the listeners are like, this is fascinating, so many things about sharks. For the life of me, I can't think of a shark question. So I'm going to say, Mark, anything else fascinating about sharks? Because I'm sure there's a lot of things. What's, what's one of your favourite shark He's facts? thrown out a lot of fascinating facts it's amazing, about isn't sharks. It? Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the uh, another features of sharks that's really interesting, again, partly to do with the energetics and a whole range of other aspects of the shark, but unlike fishes, they don't have a, an air bladder in their in their body to give them lift. So you would, have, you would see fish, they can hover. They might be flapping their fins a little bit, but they can just sit still in the water because inside their body they have a balloon full of gas and they can actually absorb gas or push gas into that little bladder and that gives them, depending on the depth that the, ship, the fish is. Sharks don't have that. So if a shark stops swimming, as we talked about before, it'll just sink to the bottom. However, they've got all these different tactics, evolutionary tactics to give them more chance of staying aloft in the water. And one of those is that they have a really, really big liver filled with an oil. Uh, one, of the, one of the oils is squalene, but it's filled with oils that is of a lower density than, than seawater. So that actually gives the shark a little bit of lift. And the liver typically takes up about a one third or sometimes even more of the whole body cavity. Oh, wow. It's a massive bilobal organ. It does all sorts of other things for sharks as well, but their lift is a big part of it. So that means the other organs in their body have to be smaller to, again, to sort of have that nice fusiform shape. So their intestines, their small intestines, are in a, a little organ called the spiral valve. It's a discrete organ. It sort of looks a bit like a, a, a cucumber, I guess, more or less. But the food passes down through this organ, through this spiral that goes all the way down this sort of cucumber-shaped organ, and the spiral gives a massive surface area. So it's almost like the equivalent of a small intestine, but compressed into this tiny little organ called the spiral valve. And different sharks have different kinds of spiral valves. Some are like a more traditional spiral, like a spiral staircase, but very compressed. And then you have some that are more like a scroll, um, yeah, it's different, different sort of variations on that theme. And again, that sort of, that means that that part of their anatomy takes up less space and there's more space for the, for the liver. Now there's one shark that does things a little differently and that's one of my favorites. It's the gray nurse shark called a ragged tooth shark in South Africa and the sand tiger in the USA. It's all the same species. Cacarius taurus, its name is, it's a scientific name. 
they actually go to the surface, gulp air, and store the air in their stomach. <laughs> and that gives them buoyancy. And so it's one of the few sharks that can just sit, hang still in the water and stay afloat. And its, its pectoral fins are really quite flexible by comparison to all the other sharks because it just stores this water and just uh, sorry stores it stores this air in the stomach it just hangs there and, uh, and when it wants to drop down yeah farts or burps they, it actually does they, they actually do they, they, burp, they burp out air wow or they take in more air to adjust their buoyancy which is which is remarkable now another really cool feature of this shark and then i'll i'll zip it um, sharks have three sort of reproductive strategies we'll say loosely one is that they are there's one group of animals, one group of sharks that are viviparous, which means they give birth to live young. They have an umbilical cord and they have live young. So, for example, the tiger shark does that, and there are other sharks that do that. Then there are the oviparous sharks, and cat sharks are like that. They actually lay eggs, which we talked about before. They can um, lay the eggs and then they just depart, and the embryo develops and hatches. And I will just add that there is no parental care postpartum for any shark species. Once they're born, they're on their own. There's no suckling. There's no, you know, there's no thing. They're on their own. But then the, the great earth shark is different again. This is the third strategy. And they are ovoviviparous. And what that means is they actually have eggs inside in utero. And those eggs hatch or some of those eggs hatch, and the offspring eat the other eggs or even their siblings in utero, and then they're born live. Mm. And another quirk of shark biology is that they have two uteri, and so you can have two pups born from one female from two different uteruses. Or two different uteri. To keep them away from each other. Well, you know, so <laughs> presumably. And they are, because they, they have this really bizarre, it's called um, oophagy is the consumption of eggs and interuterine cannibalism is the strategy for eating your brothers and your sisters. Wow. Um, so that makes them, I guess, more susceptible to um, environmental impacts. Because the other thing is that they, they, are, they migrate, this species, and they only reproduce once every two years. And they only have up to two offspring. So they're very vulnerable to overfishing or to environmental disturbance, that kind of thing. And in fact, um, grey nurse on the east coast of Australia are critically endangered because they're so vulnerable to disturbances and they have this very specific life history strategy that makes them more vulnerable. Um, if a shark eats itself, does it get bigger or disappear? <laughs> Sorry. I think we're, now, we're now in the metaphysics. Of <laughs> um, that's fascinating. That wow. Very fascinating. Yeah, I love that. Um, Mark, thank you so, so much for all that awesome information about sharks. We didn't talk about Adelaide Zoo a lot. I'm very, really relatively new to the zoo and in many ways new to a lot of the animals at the zoo. Um, but I'm just as passionate about the team and the animals and just uh, it's, a, it's a great place to work. And uh, I, I, particularly what I mentioned before, I love seeing people grow, not just the animals grow, but seeing people grow. And I think people working with something that they truly love and working alongside people who are working with things that they truly love is really, really uplifting and aspirational. And I love that too. There's, a lot, there's, so, there's just so much I like about it. And of course, Adelaide Zoo does do a lot of conservation work, which is interesting because out in the community in Adelaide, you talk about um, what you do. You know, people say, well, what do you do? And I say, well, I work at the Adelaide Zoo. Think, oh, my God, that's so cool. That's such a great job. And when you start to talk a little bit, you realise that very few people know the conservation work the Adelaide I've, Zoo does. I've yeah. said that before, that I don't think Adelaide Zoo make a big enough thing about the conservation work that yeah. they do. And you're absolutely right about that. I'll say even more, the whole zoo and aquarium industry have historically been terrible at telling those stories and it's a really it's a bit of mysterious as to why i don't mm. know why that's been such a difficult story to tell but i think in some ways there are different incentives you know people go to a zoo because of biophilia and just love of living organisms 
And some of that is, it's a very visceral experience. It's not very cognitive. It's more, you're drawn to the animal because you just love it and you just want to be near it. And uh, in some cases you want to hold it or touch it or interact with it in some way. And the conservation part is in some ways it's a bit more cognitive, it's a bit more thoughtful and a bit longer term. And I, I think some people come to the zoo with that in mind. But most people, most people, their first thought is, I want to go to the zoo because I want to be in and around and near animals. That just that intrinsic, innate biophilia that is just such a strong motivation. And in some ways, the conservation becomes a secondary thing, or is a secondary thing. And what? then they fall in love with the conservation part. Mm. And you have people who dedicate their their career to it or they join the board of the zoo or they become a member of the zoo because they they understand and they really believe in the conservation component and hmm. i think people are enjoying that a lot more i've said the story before on a podcast my my sister-in-law over in england wasn't that not not that not wasn't that thrilled but you know wasn't that bothered about me because i love zoos taking my nephew who was two or three years old at that point to the zoo, to, to Chester Zoo, one of my favourite oh, zoos love in the Chester world. Zoo. Um, and and it was kind of like she she just didn't really understand what zoos do now, and I, and I think it's a shame. Like you're saying, from all zoos, they don't actually tell you what they're doing behind the scenes, because she just thought, and and rightly so, because they don't tell you. She just thought it was caged animals that that we're going to look at, which isn't great. But zoos are so much different than that now. And I definitely think that the next step for zoos is to promote themselves with what they're actually doing. Yeah. Because I think it will it will bring on more visitors as well. Yeah. It, it's so positive in every single way. Yeah, it is. I mean, I totally agree. It is interesting. There are, I mean, there are still, like any industry, there are some zoos that aren't great. Mm. And uh, increasingly around the world, I think not just increasingly, it's sort of now the rule... There are zoological associations and their role is to lift up all zoos as much as they possibly can. And in some cases, as you, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, uh, there are regulations in place to protect uh, animals and people from bad actors. Mm. And uh, sadly, there are some bad actors in the zoo world. Fortunately, there are more good actors and there are more uh, good zoos. But you, you sort of think, I think some people have a bit of an archaic view of what a zoo is. Yeah, for sure. In the sense of, you know, sort of a dilettante uh, pipe smoking person who has a smoking jacket on and, you know, it's, it's a very sort of archaic, very, very armchair naturalist approach to stamp collecting. Hmm. And that's, there was a time when that was the case. But that's not where we are now. It's, hmm. We've come so far from that from that era and yet I think there's a bit of a residual memory of that yeah in a lot of people like a historical memory of that I guess and to change practices on a large scale doesn't happen overnight either so mm. you, you know you've got to bring a, an entire industry along and our understanding of animal welfare and animal cognition even in just the last decade let alone the last half century has just become has grown and changed so much, all for, you know, like all for the better. We've just learned so much about animals and we've learned so much about uh, consciousness and uh, so much about how important cognitively engaging an animal, uh, how important that is for their welfare. All of that's just grown markedly in the last decade and like I said, the last sort of 20, 30, 50 years. And it takes a while to sort of for that to come along uh, and get incorporated into how the practices you use at a zoo or an aquarium or a, or a fauna park, and and I think that's it's very healthy. We should constantly be going through a process of self-examination and saying, well, how can we do things better? And we, uh, you know, we, we con- we're constantly looking forward to do to do imp- to make improvements, and uh, it's very easy to forget what's just behind you and, and how far you've come and mm. how, how advanced the, the zoo world is. But coming back to your point, uh, one of those attendant with those changes has been this growth in education and this growth in research. And what in some cases started as a sort of a stamp collecting approach to a, to a zoo or an aquarium 
now that's just an, that really is an anachronism and nowadays it is research and it is conservation that and education that drives that's the purpose of the zoo and it's obviously central to the mission of Adelaide Zoo you know we want to connect people to nature connect people to wild spaces and use that connection to to uh, result in conservation outcomes it's, mm. it's very very clear that that's the mission of the zoo and that, that would be like the more that that education works and the more that that conservation message gets put out there by some of the big zoos that are doing great work, the more under pressure these little backstreet, dodgy yeah. type zoos are going to become. And, yeah, no, that, that's... You know, so it, it helps in every way, I think. That, that is absolutely true. And in the association, Australasian Association, which isn't that large an association by, by global standards... There are still over 100 members in the Australasian Zoological and Aquarium Association, which is pretty impressive. Mm. In the USA, I think it's like 3,000 uh, members. And uh, EASA, which is the European equivalent, they have uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of members as well. But yeah, I think, it, I think you're right. They're, the male actors, um, they have to lift up their game, have to improve their practices, mm. Uh, or they will ultimately go extinct. Yeah, because education is telling everyone that that's not actually the right way yeah. of doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all positive. I think the future's pretty good. I love zoos. I'm, I am very pro zoos. Just the empathy that they, they give to people that visit them at young ages, you know. Kids in Australia, are, a, a big percentage of kids in Australia are not going to see a giraffe or an elephant in the wild so you know how do they gain empathy for that type of animal unless they go to Monato or Adelaide or whatever so I think it's amazing I think zoos are great Hmm. awesome well Mark thank you for coming on well thank you both very much for being so indulgent and it was my pleasure Um, and guys thank you for listening